coming on is going to perfect so thank you all for coming to this uh this seminar it's the last one of the year and we're very lucky to welcome um today uh, giacomo boffi who will be sharing with us his insights on a working paper on the net fiscal pol uh, position of migrants in europe a decomposition analysis. Giacomo Boffi is a PhD candidate uh, on economics and governance uh, of migration, jointly appointed by the Department of Economics at Leiden University and Leiden University College. His PhD research is conducted within the interdisciplinary focus area, citizenship, migration, and global transformations. His PhD research examines whether, how, when, and why immigration affects socioeconomic policies, pensions, unemployment, taxes, healthcare, and how that relates to social citizenship. Giacomo Boffi completed a master's degree in economic policy in 2018 at Utrecht University, and prior to that, he obtained a bachelor's degree in politics and economics at the University of Milan, Italy. Just a bit about the uh, of housekeeping info, seminars are planned for one hour, uh, of which 40 minutes are set aside for presentation and 24 questions discussion uh, with the audience. So if you have any clarification questions, feel free to ask them during the presentation, but please save uh, the more substantial questions and comments for after the presentation. With that being said, let me give the floor to Giacomo. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you, Saw, for the kind words of introduction. Uh, today, we're going to speak mostly about my second chapter in my PhD dissertation, of which the title you can see already on the first slide, the net fiscal position of migrants in Europe, a decomposition analysis. But before diving into the second, into the second chapter, I would like to give you a brief introduction on the overall aim of my PhD research and also on the first chapter, because you can see there is a, uh, a more broader correlation between the first two, the first two chapters. Even though Saw so has been already kind to give most of the information about myself already to, to you, let me just repeat quickly what is my, my formal title. So I'm a, a research in economics and governance of migrations. I'm based at Leiden University. And in the course of my PhD, I'm going to write four articles all addressing the relationship between migration and social citizenship intended as a broader concept of citizenship than just voting rights. So for example, participation in the welfare state, in the labor market, in the healthcare of a country, uh, obtaining education also. I'm under the supervision of Olaf Van Fleet, Edward Sorendreau and Anar Akhmadov. I started a couple of years ago, just before Corona hit, and I'm planning on finishing at the beginning of January, 2024. Uh, I will give you now a couple of uh, minutes on the on the first paper to show you how my research started, and then we will dive better into the second. As the first paper, I was mostly interested in the Dutch labor market to see the temporary employment patterns of first-generation migrants in the Netherlands. Why so? The interest sparked from uh, two contemporaneous phenomena happening right now in the Dutch labor market of which the first is a rising flexibilization. As you know, probably already in most countries, temporary contracts and temporary form of employment are on the rise. More specifically, the Netherlands has been the country which has faced the fastest growth in temporary contract in the last 10 years. And that's why I was particularly interested in the Dutch case. It's not the country with the highest uh, absolute value of temporary jobs. That will be Spain and Poland, respectively. However, it's been the, the country with the fastest growth. So let's see why this growth is happening. At the same time, we know also that there is a rising participation of foreign born individuals, so migrants, uh, to the labor force. Therefore, my interest in the first paper is to see whether these two phenomena are related and to what extent do migrants cover these new temporary jobs that have been created in the Netherlands. I'll skip most of, the, most of the slides on the first paper, given that we will focus on the second in this seminar. However, I want to remark that in case you want more information on the first paper, feel free also to ask me in the debate after, after my presentation for more information, more tables on the first part of my research. I base my, re my research on previous literature on social exclusion, because we know that for people who enter a temporary labor market, in the older stages 
of their career, this can be very dangerous. It can lead to social exclusion with the persistent gap between people who, have, uh, who are employed and unemployed. And mostly I focus on integration factors that might facilitate the, uh, the integration of migrants within the labor market and therefore reduce their probability of being temporarily employed. I focused on education. I focused on, fo on language problems, therefore the ability to speak Dutch, and I focused on their social contacts. This is the richest question. So whether migrants are more likely to be temporarily employed than natives, and more specifically, which of these three channels explain part of the difference. I use the data from the, the LIST panel, which I'm sure most of you know is a, is a micro panel following Dutch individuals, Dutch residents, sorry, for the last um, 20 years. It's very representative. There's almost no relevant attrition. So we'll stick just to the, to the most basic information. The methodology is a simple selection on and observables methodology with poor less. You can see here the, the equation. We have the probability to be temporary employed on the left of the equation. On the right, we have the migration background and B, a series of background characteristics, which I will also use in the second paper under X, and then profession and sector of employment. And then we have education, language problems, and social contacts. I have data for 14 years, so I can follow the same people over a long period of time. I'll skip most of the part of the analysis just to count the results to give you a first glimpse of that. I found out the having a migration indeed increases the chances of being temporarily employed. And this result is entirely driven by no Western migrant. Okay, so Western migrants do have a 3% probability higher to be temporary employed. However, the result is not significant. Among the three channels that we saw, which might influence the probability of being temporarily employed, remember education, language problems in Dutch, and um, social contacts, only language appear as a mechanism significantly affecting the probability of being temporarily employed. You can see in the second point of the slide that people migrant with, that, uh, with language problems present 13.2 percentage points more likelihood of being temporarily employed than natives. So why from a paper strictly focused on the Dutch labor market did I move to a broader paper on uh, European countries? As we saw in the title is a, is a, is a decomposition for, for European countries, not only for the, for the Dutch labor market. Well, because the social citizenship is defined both in terms of the labor market position of migrants, but also in terms of their fiscal position. And I found particularly interesting to estimate their net fiscal position. What is the net fiscal position? Is the uh, position that each one individuals in the, in the active in the labor market may, uh, may present, namely is just a simple calculation of how much do we pay in contributions to, to the state, the public sector, therefore taxes at the national and local level on personal income, wealth taxes, and social security contribution. So this is what all we pay to the, um, to the public sector. And what do we receive in exchange? We receive benefits, okay? For example, let's take the case of the Netherlands to stay more focused on the, on the, local, on the local labor market. Uh, we all know that we can get benefits like the Urtuslach or the Zortuslach for our health insurance, for housing, for children. So how much do we get in, um, in exchange for our public contribution, okay? If we subtract how much do we get from how much we pay, we get the net fiscal position. Therefore, you can already realize that the individuals might be net fiscal contributor if they pay more than what they receive or net fiscal recipient if they receive more than what they pay. Why I'm interested in this? Uh, while I was making this presentation, I tried to um, put together some of the titles that came out on the newspaper on uh, migrants and their exploitation, their so-called exploitation of the welfare state, uh, as usually um, populist politicians like to portray. And I came up with several, several headlines, and these are just from the from the last year, even less. 
So you can see that the integration of migrants and whether they are they actually using more benefits than what they're contributing is a hot topic nowadays. It's a hot topic recently because of, for example, the issues at the border between Poland and Belarus or at the issue in the channel between France and the UK has been an issue in the Netherlands given the, 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 benefit, the child benefit scandal that happened last year. And it's still an issue from the refugee crisis. So from the refugee crisis in 2015, the debate on whether migrants are contributing or just enjoying the rich uh, Western European welfare state has never settled. Therefore, I think it's quite important to ground this debate to anchor it on empirical facts. And that's why I decided to actually estimate the net fiscal composition of migrants across the European countries. We already talked about the simple conceptualization of the net fiscal position. However, it's important to define a dynamic approach versus a static approach. Uh, a dynamic approach will be a fiscal position that takes into account different fiscal behaviors. So you can be a contributor on one year, you can be a net recipient on one year uh, across time. Okay, we can imagine, for example, the migrants who migrate uh, are immediately net fiscal recipient because probably they cannot contribute immediately to the labor market. Maybe they need to find a job still. And as they get integrated, they become net contributor, especially if they're young. And of course, as they retire, they become net fiscal recipient. So a full dynamic approach will be, to take in, will be able to take into account the different fiscal behavior of people across their age, okay? Across their lifespan. However, it's a quite utopic approach, if I can say. It's very difficult to find data that allow to follow find panels that allow to follow the same individuals across the whole lifespan and to see a sufficient amount of changes to justify a full dynamic approach. Therefore, most of the approaches to the net fiscal position available right now in the literature and also the approach that we'll adopt is static. So it's a cross-sectional approach. You pull together a number of years and among uh, the people available individual in the, your sample in those years, you can estimate whether at that point of time and not across across uh, across a year in a, as in a dynamic approach, they are net contributor or net recipient. Okay, so my approach will be will be static. I like also to highlight that is a quite um, that is um, a concept to be used carefully, because of course the net fiscal position might also be um, quite deceiving if not compared with different data. It should be compared, for example, with GDP, with the GDP size of a country, because we will see, for example, in later in later slides, that even though some numbers may look really really high as uh, migrants being net recipient or net contributors, however, if we compare them to the overall size of the GDP, they are always within the one percent range. Okay, so the um, uh, the all the fuzz brought up by the new by the by the mass media on whether migrants are actually exploiting the welfare the western welfare state should be already be um, reduced to just a one percentage more or less of the gdp value okay so that's already puts the facts into a perspective another concern another um, measure we should use carefully is whether migrants uh, our migrants are net fiscally benefiting from a country, okay? Because migrants arrive generally already with a higher education. And that's something that the country is already providing to its natives, but it doesn't have to provide most of the times for migrants, okay? So migrants generally migrate, which are already older, ready to enter the labor market. So you have to remember that for these people, the wealth, the, the public sector is not paying most of the times on education because they're already educated in their, in their origin country. And therefore, this is already something to take into account in their net fiscal position, okay? Of course, the data most of the times are not available on this, so we're not able to um, exactly estimate how valuable is the education they got in actual money terms in their origin country. However, it's good to keep in mind these macroeconomic considerations. 
what is the current state of the literature on the subject? I decided to divide the current literature in three main blocks. We have um, studies based on the same data that I'm using. The data is uh, the UCIC database, which is a European Union survey on income and living conditions. It's a quite similar survey to the European Labor Force survey. However, it, com it uh, gives me a richer uh, amount of information on the benefits that individuals are receiving, and that's why I use it. So first part of the literature is focused on previous studies on the same, with the same data. I like to point out, first of all, at the study by Boeri in 2009, which was the first study using the UCIRC to estimate the net fiscal position of individuals. And it didn't find any significant evidence that skilled migrants coming from outside the European Union were net recipients of, uh, of generous European welfare states. And there are also different, different studies focused only on countries. So they may use the UCILC or not. However, their approach is uh, just directed to one single fiscal, uh, fiscal country, fiscal system, yeah. I like to, for example, here to point out that a study by Dusman and Dasman and Frattini, 2010, 2014, because they are quite, um, empirically quite solid studies. And their focus is on the UK, which is usually a labor market brought in comparison with European Union. And that's why I like to, to have this also in my, in my slide. Um, they found out that for the UK, EU migrants are most of the time not contributors, while migrants coming outside the European Union are most of the time not recipient. So this is already a difference that we might keep in mind. Therefore, there is also a st third stream of the literature focused more on cross-country comparisons, and these usually take the form of policy papers. Why do they take the forms of policy paper? Because usually the actors bringing up these cross-country comparators are institutions, policy institutions. For example, international institutions such as the OECD have done a couple of times already net fiscal estimations for the position of uh, native and, uh, and migrants across the OECD countries, obviously. A first study was conducted in 2013 and they found out that immigrants are generally net contributors to the to the to the to the to the to the welfare state rather than natives, okay. But it's generally uh, driven by uh, lower taxes and social security contributions rather than a higher dependence on benefits, okay. And again, in a study conducted just this year, it's from the Migration Outlook published by the OECD a couple of months ago. They repeated the findings. The findings are very similar, and they found out again, as previously brought up in the literature, that the fiscal impact of immigrants compared to the GDP size of the country of, across OECD, OECD member countries is generally between 1% and minus 1%, okay? So a relatively small impact, either positive or negative. What will be my contribution then given this, given this state of the literature? First of all, I want to estimate whether migrants are net contributors or net recipient. And that will be the focus of my uh, descriptive analysis, which is the, the largest part of the slides I'm gonna present to you today. As so um, already said in the introduction, this is a work in progress. So I'm looking forward to actually receiving your comments and your opinions, of course, also your criticisms on my on the state of the research so far, because uh, I'm it's a it's a very provisional research right now. We'll see better in the in later slides. And therefore, many points could still be improved. Okay, I'm more focused on to do for today on the descriptive part of it. For what regards, instead, the actual the composition analysis, I'm still building up. I have some provisional evidence, but I look forward to hear your comments on how to improve the decomposition analysis. After a first question on whether migrants are purely net contributors and net recipients, of course, I wanna to I want to check whether this fiscal position of migrants is different from the one of natives across a number of European countries. And for this, I use a simple OLS model to estimate whether having a migration status of a first generation type brings, as in my first paper, brings significant statistical, uh, statistical differences to the net fiscal position of individuals. So whether do migrants are more or less contributors than natives, and finally, as I said, the, 
the, the last part of the analysis is concerned with decomposing the effect of the fiscal position, the, um, the, the gap between the, the contribution of migrants as net fiscal, um, the net fiscal position of migrants, whether we include controls in their net fiscal estimation or not. So the exact blind data composition we're gonna implement is gonna explain how much of the difference we're gonna observe between the net fiscal position of migrants and natives, whether we include controls or not, okay? On, um, on, my on the contribution side, first of all, this is a, a, an update of the paper by Boeri in 2009, because I used the same approach and the same data, data from both the OECD and the UCIC. Now we're gonna see more specifically which ones. I use 14 and more countries, all from the European Economic Area. I distinguish myself from the literature because most of the times the literature is concerned only with the, with the question whether migrants a welfare um, recipient and to what extent. So not for the, with the full fiscal position, but to only which extent they're actually enjoying the benefits of a country. And the literature is really rich on this subject, especially because the UC uh, data, the one I'm gonna use is very complete on the subject. And here are just some of the most recent studies uh, which are valuable to understanding the, the welfare dependency of migrants in a number of European countries. However, there is not a huge literature on the broad net fiscal position for European countries, okay? Finally, on a more methodological level, the, the composition technique I already mentioned, the OACA blinder one I'm gonna implement, is something that has not been already, has not been implemented yet in, uh, in estimating the difference in net fiscal position between natives and migrants. So my focus also empirically is to estimate how much of this difference is actually explained by the background characteristic of, uh, of migrants, okay? So this will be the, the, the empirical contribution to the literature. Let's get to, to some conceptualization between entering the, the data. We can define migrants either as foreign born or as foreign citizens. Obviously you already know the difference between the two. What are the implications of these two approaches? If I, def I, def I decide to define migrant as foreign born, I will not be able to take into account the natives who are born abroad and simply for whatever reason they were born in a different country and then move immediately to their home country. However, there is also a problem if I use a foreign citizen conceptualization because different countries implement different naturalization laws. Uh, I have to choose between our two approaches, of course, given the, given the study that I'm gonna conduct. I decided to opt for the first one, so the one highlighted in, in yellow on the slide, the foreign born approach, because nationalization laws play a higher role, in my opinion, on the integration of migrants and of course also on their migratory, on their migratory patterns, okay? Let's get to the data. I get data on taxes and social security contributions from the OECD because the UCIC dat database is not very complete on the topic. I use a specific OECD publication, which is called Taxing Wages, and it's the same publication that Boeri was using for his similar research in 2009. I have data on uh, national personal income tax rates with thresholds, brackets, uh, tax-free sums, and max contributions. So it's, quite very, it's a very complete information. I also have uh, data uh, on the local personal income taxes. For example, in federal countries, there are different tax rates between the local state level and the general state level, take Germany, for example, but also in unitary countries like Italy, there is a huge gap between uh, municipality taxes and, uh, and national level taxes. And finally, from the OECD publication, I also have a good variable for social security contributions, okay? And again, here I have thresholds, tax-free contributions, so the amount they can uh, keep without paying any tax upon it and the max contribution for each individual, okay? From the UCIC, on the, side, on the tax side, I have a good variable for wealth taxes. So this will be all the variables that I use for estimating the total contribution of an individual to the, uh, to the welfare state, okay? For the other side of the equation, so for how much the individual is receiving from the welfare state, the, the, the benefits 
I use only data from the UCILC, okay? I have data on contributory and non-contributory benefits. The contributory benefits are measured at the individual level. So how much you pay, how much you get. This is a very clear uh, pay-as-you-go system in the, in the contributory one. This will be education, uh, old age, so uh, retirement, sickness, and uh, survival. So to, to sustain individuals which are in, uh, in difficulty situations and, uh, and unemployment benefits. So these will be all the benefits uh, contributory measured at the individual level. Then I have another span of benefits measured uh, at the household level, which are non-contributory. So that do not depend on how much are you paying as you go. This will be child benefits because they are of course independent on whether you are uh, working for a high income salary or for a low income salary. I have housing benefits and I have other types of benefits that the UC uh, classifies under social exclusion, which may differ from country to country. However, these are very small, these are a very small uh, part of the benefits, so it should not be too much of a concern for us. Which data am I using? For the sample we're studying today, I based my uh, study only on 2018. The goal for the end of the study is to include multiple years. I already have an idea of which one to include to see different net fiscal position across times. However, for today, we only have a cross-sectional for 2018. Even if it's only one year, the size of the sample is, uh, is, is a high, it's very big. We have uh, 24,000 uh, observations, so 24,000 um, um, 240,000 individuals, sorry, not 24,000, 240,000 individuals. We have my EU migrants, so migrants coming from the European Union and moving to other European countries, which make up 4% of the sample. And we have migrants coming to you from extra EU countries making up 6.9% of the sample. In total, we have migrants around 11% of the sample, okay? These are the countries I'm conducting the analysis for because they have complete data on benefits and on taxes. As you can see, most of the, uh, of the largest European economies are included. You can see that unfortunately the Netherlands are missing because they do not provide to Eurostat and the UCIC data on benefits. So it will be kind of a hassle to incorporate data from the, from the CBS on the, on the sample that I'm using. Therefore, I, I decided to drop the, the Netherlands. I have 14 countries, all the one marked in red for which I can distinguish EU and uh, extra EU migrants, okay? And I have four countries in orange for which unfortunately there is also Germany because it's one of the main eco European economies and that's why it's quite unfortunately unfortunate fact. I cannot distinguish between different migration statuses. So I cannot distinguish between Western and non-Western migrants. Now we move to the descriptive analysis, as I said, we, we uh, noticed that extra EU migrants are on average younger in bigger households and with more children than both natives and, uh, and, uh, and EU migrants. I also noticed that EU migrants are the one presenting the highest level of higher education in my sample. And for what regards the health patterns, which are quite important for migration issues because you generally may be thinking of migrating if you are healthy because you can contribute to the labor force and also because maybe uh, in on the opposite case you'll be more eager to migrate because you can get higher health benefits in a country okay so these two reasons may drive um, migration on a health point of view from a health point of view however when i look at my sample the three groups natives EU migrants and extra EU migrants do not present differences on health, um, on health uh, variables. Health variables are self-reported. Self it's, it's a survey, so it's people just reporting whether they describe their health as very good, good or bad. And uh, across the three groups, the, the percentages of people reporting uh, a good health is similar for all the three groups. On this slide, we can get we can start crunching some numbers and we can see what are the average taxes and social security contributions for the three population groups. We can see that by far natives are the one contributing with most taxes. This will be explained again by the fact that migrants need some time before integrating into the labor market 
and therefore start contributing. And the same is valid also for the social security contributions, okay? You will see in the tables following that there's a huge, there is a huge cross-country variation. Therefore, the goal of my final analysis will be to actually explain this cross-country variation. However, for today, we will be studying mostly the countries pulled together because it will require, of course, a, a much longer time also in the presentation to just talk for each country singularly. For this, of course, the, the final paper will be, will be the perfect tool. On the script is for the, for the contributory benefits. We see the um, EU migrants and natives on average have a similar level of benefits per year of 4,000 euros, more than 4,000 euros. And they their take up rates are a bit different. Namely, EU migrants are very, very able to, to enter the welfare state in the, in the host country, 56% do so, enter the welfare state and get benefits, while only 43% of the natives do so. And it's very interesting to see the extra EU migrants present the lowest values, both in terms of take up. So only 31% of the extra EU migrants in Europe actually get benefits. And this will be already a first indication against the common misconception that migrants, especially extra EU one, exploit the European welfare state. And also their mean their mean uh, value of benefit per year is uh, less than the one of you migrants and natives. Okay, this is a first, a first good comparison, I would say, among the three groups. For what regards non-contributory benefit, the picture is a bit different. So benefits that you're getting independently of your uh, employment status. Um, we see that in this case, natives, are the one with the lowest level of benefits. EU migrants are still the one with the highest participation and the highest level of benefit. But now uh, non-EU migrants have similar values to EU migrants. So they are not the outlier group in this case. In this case, natives are the outliers and EU migrants and extra EU migrants have similar values. With extra EU migrants slightly less active and with the lower value of benefits on average. I see I still have roughly five to 10 minutes, so we'll try to look a bit at the descriptives um, with quite some pace to get into the analysis. This is the first net fiscal position estimation for the um, for natives. I want to alight here, I wanted to alight on the left that um, natives are on average net fiscal recipients of from the state. So given what we saw before, okay. And this is how much they get on average. This is how much they, they contribute. I found out that on average, um, natives are receiving more than 2000 euro per year. So they're not fiscal recipients from the, from the rich welfare state of European countries. Again, all the countries are put together. So you could see in the table, that there are substantial differences across countries, both in the size of the benefits and also in the <clears throat> in the population in the population size. Okay. However, this is a very very interesting first fact. For what regards EU migrants, we saw they remember they're highly contributors, but also highly recipient of the welfare state. Therefore, the net fiscal position kinds of balances out, and their net fiscal contributors only by a very low amount. So each migrant on average contributes to the welfare state by 500 euros per year, okay? So it's not a high size as the recipiency of natives and especially it's on the opposite side. So they're not receiving money, but they're actually paying for the welfare state. Very interesting fact. And again, you can see a lot of cross country variation. Finally, we see, um, we see uh, extra EU migrants. In this case, again, the value is very small because the two, uh, the two sides of the equation, taxes and benefits kind of balances out. However, the final result is negative. So um, non-EU migrants are on average across country in 2018. So contextualized net fiscal recipient of 300 euros per year, okay? 
again, please look at the cross country variation because it's very interesting to see, to see the differences. However, these two data already taken together show how migrants are actually, and also following the literature, not taking advantage of the European welfare state, but rather contributing to the welfare state. Because the only group, population group across the three, uh, across the three that I'm considering, natives, EU migrants, and non-migrants, and non-EU migrants, sorry, actually receiving money more than what is paying is the one of natives, not one of EU or non-EU migrants. I mean, no, I mean, of course, uh, non-EU migrants are, um, are receiving money, however, to a much lower extent, as I was saying, than the, than the natives. How do we get into the uh, actual regression analysis and the decomposition? For the second question in my research, you remember that I was interested in saying whether the migration status influences the net fiscal position of an individual. Therefore, by, by, by means of OLS, I estimate the equation reporting on the slide here. On the left-hand side, I have an net fiscal position of the individual in time t. Time t will be 2018 in this time, in this, uh, in this case. B1 will be the coefficient for a migration variable taking value one, where the individual is a migrant, and zero, where the individual is a, is a native. This, this equation, of course, can also be changed. This, uh, this term can also be changed with an origin variable separating between EU and extra EU migrants. But in this case, I'm just pulling them together for, uh, for the sake of concisiveness right now. And then I have a bunch of uh, population characteristics grouped under this vector variable, okay, XIT. This will be yearly, sp um, yearly specific effects. Of course, given that the year is only one, they will be they will be they will not be relevant in the in the current estimation but given that the goal is to do it for multiple years i wanted to still report it in the in the equation because this will be the equation applied for each country for all the years and this is the error term the final one the aka blender decomposition as already said is going to be explained how much of beta one um the difference in beta one between natives and migrants when including or excluding control is explained by demographic characteristics, which are the one that I'm using. They are the one that I was using more or less already in the, in the first paper. And they are the one used already in most of the cases in the literature, age, gender, civil status, here near, near codified as being married or not married, the number of children at home, the household size, because the two things can also differ and present different uh, signs, whether an individual is living in a city or not, so urban living, having higher education or not, and presenting good health or not. The provisional results of LS uh, show that being a migrant consistently with the descriptive analysis increases the net fiscal position. So as I already said, migrants are on average net fiscal contributors um, to, the, to the welfare state by 829 euros. So being a migrant brings a positive increase in the net fiscal position of, a, of the individual. The full table is not available here. However, if you're interested, I have it in the presentation I can show you at the end. And for what regards the decomposition, so how much of it is explained by the demographic characteristics. Uh, if you know a bit the, how the OACA decomposition uh, works, you know that there is a, an explainable part of the effect of this 829 and an unexplainable part. The decomposition is gonna look at the explainable part. I, I'm not gonna put the full model specification here because I know that the uh, among you, there are also um, social scientists from different, uh, from, different, uh, from different disciplines and not only from, uh, from microeconomics. So we'll be kind of redundant to just Put only numbers. I focus more on the on the insights coming from the numbers. Uh, so this will be the meaning, the meaning of it. How much of it is explained by the background characteristics? And we found out that age is the background characteristic with the highest positive impact on the net fiscal position. So as you're growing older, you participate more to the labor force, and this is significant to the one percent. And therefore, you're also improving your net fiscal position. So contributing more to the country. 
being married and being highly educated are two other variables positively contributing to the net fiscal position of migrants. So migrants who are married and are highly educated, coherent with the theory of human capital, are contributing to a greater extent to the, um, to the, to the welfare state. They're not recipient, but they're mostly contributors. And two variables that instead don't show um, big effects. Their effect is significant, but they're not, uh, they're not uh, great in magnitude across countries will be gender, interestingly, and health. Most interesting also health. The fact that migrants do not present very different health patterns that we saw in the descriptives. And also um, their net fiscal position is not greatly explained by different health statuses. I think I'm right on time and I can just spend a few more words now on the, on the way forward for this paper, because we saw it's very much of a work in progress right now. The decomposition analysis will be greatly improved for a pool of countries, a greater pool of countries. And also I will, I will de divide the effect between, between uh, EU and extra EU migrant. I will expand analysis for multiple years. And then also I'm coming to you. So which factors do you think I should also take into account in my analysis as factors possibly playing a role in the decomposition? Um, and the final goal, of course, for my paper will be to provide the composition analysis for each of the country included in my in my samples for the 14 countries so that we can see across countries and not just by pooling them together what is the net fiscal position what is the net fiscal position compared to the one of natives for migrants and what are the factors playing um, a deterministic role in the um, in the net fiscal position of migrants across years and across countries i think this is it if you want to give me feedback uh, more extensive feedback that, of course, now maybe cannot be cannot be given given time time constraints. Feel free to reach me uh, out at, uh, on LinkedIn or send me an email at my university university email address. And thank you for your attention. Thank you all for your attention, and thank you very much, Giacomo, for this presentation. I'm going to open the floor for feedback, comments, questions. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, thanks so much for this presentation. Um, of course, I immediately started to have lots of questions and I know you're still in the beginning stages and I, I think there are a lot of interesting things that you can continue the analysis with. So, well, maybe first I have a clarification question because you say gender um, is significant, but what gender? Ah, yeah. uh, right, so you can't just say gender, Obviously. right? <laughs> yeah. Obviously, that was a. I think it was a. I think it was um just a specification of the table, and then of course in my mind I did. I didn't change it on the slide. Was being a female, being a female. Okay, so if you're female, you you um you are si be, slightly better for the welfare state in a way. Yeah, you will be on average slightly better. I remember the effect was very very small, but still it was significant to the one percent. But that's also particularly interesting since a lot of the social benefits having to do with children go through mothers, but. Anyways, still, I, I mean, that shows that in a way, women maybe contribute even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's a, a side note. Um, so I think as far as um, maybe other controls that you can look at and other decompositions. So I would, uh, you have, have age there, but I would actually also, if you can, control for number of years in the destination country. Mm -hmm. Right, because I know that you're working with cross sections right now, but we would still expect migrants that have been there longer to be on a better path towards contribution. Right. Well, you could also think about maybe they also become more aware of how to actually get benefits. So when you look also partic um, at, at migrants, one of the expl explainers could also be not only just that they're contributing a lot, but that they also don't know what they have access to or also how to get it. And that's particularly the case with um, more vulnerable migrants. So migrants from lower socioeconomic status, things like that. So language barriers, other things could be issues there for why they're actually maybe not getting things they would be entitled to. So it would also be interesting if you could see in general for the countries that you're looking at, if there is any information out there on the differences between um, the number of people or the percentage of people that are eligible for benefits and those that actually take them up. Because it's, it's very likely that migrants are less likely to take them up when they're eligible. 
Um, then another interesting thing for you to do. So you didn't say much now um, about decompositions other than like EU, non-EU immigrants, right? But I think especially in that non-EU side, I think it would really be nice to do some regional decompositions. Um, if you can, I don't know exactly what your data looks like. I mean, I think it's too much to say like do country um, decompositions, but if you could just do, you know, Asia, Africa, North America, South America, something around that, I think that would be nice. And um, what I would also really like to see is a decomposition on skill levels. Um, so if you could do something between high, you know, middle and low skilled or something along those lines, to see you know what we see on net fiscal effects because of course the part of the idea for selective migration is the idea that highly skilled will in on average contribute more than they're ever going to get from the welfare state so it would be nice to actually look at some of these things in um in a little bit more detail if you can with with your data and i, I was actually wondering why some major EU countries are not in the data that you're using right now. So for instance, the Netherlands wasn't there, right? And I mean, I think it was going by fast and I was trying to absorb a lot, but I think Germany was also not there, right? But um, maybe you can just say a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on the on the last point and then move to the to the two to the two before. Um, if countries are not there, it must be because they do not present benefit data in the EU silk. For I have the taxes data for all the countries because all of them are members of the of the OECD. However, not all of them report their data on benefits to the to the EU silk. This is the case of the Netherlands. I have Germany. I have Germany is not reported in the tables for the net fiscal position because these are these were done. Uh, the first estimation a bit differentiating between. Uh, EU and extra EU migrants. And for Germany, this difference is not possible. So that's why I will do separate tables only for the countries that uh, do not uh, distinguish between EU and extra EU migrants. So this is why Jebel, Ger Germany is in my sample, but it's not in the tables that I showed you at the end. Here, since migration and skill level were two things we were planning on uh, looking, uh, looking into. I already looked into here since migration, because of course the literature mentioned it several times as an important factor for, for the fiscal position. Unfortunately, the variables, the data on it are quite scarce, but my idea is that as I pull more years together in the in a later stage of the analysis, of course, I will be uh, able to have um, a higher number of institutions presenting data also for their uh, age of arrival and years since migration in the, in the host country. So right now, given that I have a single year, in the, in the current sample, I have very scarce data on that, but it was definitely on the agenda for when the sample will be the final one. Yeah, because I mean, even just if you look at some of the countries and some of the things that are coming out, I mean, right now, obviously you're talking about everything on averages, but if you look at a country like Hungary, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, first of all, Hungary has very, very low migration in general. And the migration that is there now is generally very, very new, very, very specific kind yeah, of yeah, migration, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, point. a lot of these things would be able to be explained by some of these yeah, points. And that's exactly, that's why I want to, uh, to evolve my analysis into a more country level analysis. Because of course, pulling them together makes you able to, let's say, counter, counter argue to the argument that usually is like, migrants are exploiting the EU for, for getting a richer benefits. So this will be the, the message that we, we can already get out of it. However, when we want to expand this message to single or national level policies, of course, we need to provide a cross-country comparison, uh, adjusting for purchasing power, obviously, between the different countries. For what regards the skill level, this is also a possible direction that the research might take into the future, because it's the same direction that actually the paper I am based on, so Boeri 2009, was already taken in 2009 because his, uh, his, uh, his reasoning was the same that you already exemplified. So migrants with different skill levels have a higher, different or lower human capital, so they can contribute higher and lower to the, to, the, to the welfare state. So therefore, of course, I'm also moving into that direction. Finally, I think your second point was on expanding the, the analysis for non-EU migrants. And on this point, unfortunately, the data do not give me a uh, country of origin specifically. So uh, I could not really do much more than this. 
Unfortunately, this is a recurrent problem with this type of databases, like a data sets, because especially when they're panel, it's very difficult to, to, to get to the actual country of, a, of origin. They already have, generally have like macro areas. Also in my first paper, I distinguish between uh, Western and Western migrants, but I'm not able to, to distinguish between, I don't know, Eastern European and Western European migrants, which would be a first big, uh, big divide, let's say, or Asians. Asian migrants while African migrants, for example. So in that case, unfortunately, I think I will be able to expand more the, the analysis uh, within the European Union, but extra U is a, it's kind of a struggle. Have you also considered um, do, you know, writing a similar paper to this just using Dutch data from the CBS? Because then you can do a lot more decompositions. You could also do this um, longitudinally and follow yeah. people over time yeah. also? Yeah. It's what my supervisor, who's the person next to you in the, in the Zoom windows, has actually already done. So you can speak with Edward. Okay. And he did the decomposition for the, for the welfare dependencies. So not for a full net decomposition so far, but mostly on the welfare side only of it, on the like welfare benefit side of it. But yeah, he did that with the, with the CBS data. And of course, they allow for a much more complete uh, picture, let's say, for like, uh, of course, it's, very focused on just the Netherlands, so you cannot apply the same reasoning to all the countries, but it gives you a very, very sharp view of what is happening in the Dutch welfare states. Yeah. So okay. I, I can only remind you to, to his paper. Oh, great. Oh, so maybe just something that would be good for you to know also as one of my PhD students also just last week defended her PhD. Her name is Annie Yu, Y-U. Um, she just used, um, you know, Dutch administrative data just specifically looking at um, welfare receipt and uh, also welfare persistence and welfare dynamics um, mm -hmm. between natives and uh, well, between Dutch um, first generation and also sometimes second generation. And in general, I think these papers might be quite interesting for you um, okay. in general to have a look at when you're thinking about next analysis that you would like to do or even for your literature reviews. Thank you very much. I took down the name and I'll definitely look it up. I'll share with you her, her email. Okay. And Melissa, do you have any other uh, feedback or comments? Um, I'll actually look right now and see if I can um, share her thesis with you in electronic version in the chat. I just give me a much. second to do that. Thank you very much. That would be helpful. Any other comments or questions from anyone else here? I know I rushed, I rushed a bit, so if anyone has also clarification questions, do not hesitate. Okay. Seeing no questions or comments, um, I'll wait uh, for Melissa to perhaps share with you the, the, the paper before I, um, I end the call. But uh, let me just take a minute to thank you very much for your presentation and for making the time, uh, knowing that you have a very busy schedule at the moment. And thank you all for attending the migration seminar series. Your uh, attendance has been very valuable for us. Uh, this is going to be the last uh, seminar of this year. And we hope to see you all next year uh, with new content and uh, new speakers. Thank you very much again to all for, for attending. Thanks, and I sent the paper, so he has it already. Thank you, very much. Thank you all, and have um, have a great uh, rest of the week, and uh, very soon also happy holidays, and have very restful holidays. Bye bye. <laughs>